Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here broadcasting live from the ThinkTech studios on the eighth floor of Pioneer Plaza in Honolulu, Hawaii, beautiful downtown Honolulu, Hawaii, on a beautiful day. And it's even more beautiful because I have one more week of work left, and then I get to actually retire for the third time. But I'll still keep coming back and bugging Jay here at ThinkTech to see if he'll let me stay on the TV once again. Anyway, earlier this summer, I had the honor of addressing attendees at the United States Department of Defense or Energy's annual hydrogen merit review in Washington, D.C. And the merit review is a gathering of people from all over the world that have one thing in common. They are curious about hydrogen technology. You have PhDs, you have corporate technology officers, you have military scientists, you have legislators, you have sales representatives, and you have folks there that just have a passion to learn more. And there's about 1,500 folks that attend this conference. After my presentations, I usually have a few folks that come to me and ask a few questions Asked for a business card. And, you know, that's how the present, this presentation was really no different. I had some folks come up and talk to me. And one of the folks that came up was a, a great young lady that came up and had several questions. And as I was answering them, they came by and said, hey, you know, we got, we got, we got you, but you got to get out of here. There's next speakers are coming up. So I agreed to answer her questions by email, and, uh, and I did so. Uh, I actually asked her, um, it occurred to me that, there were a lot of folks out there with a passion about clean energy and sustainable technology with a lot of questions. So I asked this young lady to be on my show, but instead of me asking the questions of my guest, I wanted her to ask me the questions um, so that she could ask the questions that I don't normally think of talking about. So my guest today is not Rachel James, my normal stunt double here on Think Tech, but Mary Frost, someone I just, just as passionate about as Rachel with a ton of hydrogen questions. So Mary, Mary Frost, take it away. Thanks for, for being the host here on Stan Energy Man today. Aloha, Stan, thank you for letting me ask you questions today. I first became interested in hydrogen when I read about it long ago that anything could be stored as hydrogen. So my first question is about safety. My engineer friends tell me hydrogen is dangerous, it's flammable, even explosive. What's the rest of the story about hydrogen safety, Stan? Well, actually, when we're talking energy, anytime you store energy, you have the potential for danger. That's the definition of energy. If you had a spring that was all compressed down really tight and the, the, what was holding it in place gave loose and all that energy let loose, you could really get hurt. If you were inflating a tire with air and the tire got past its capacity to hold that pressure and it let loose, it's actually killed people. So whenever you store energy, you always have a potential for, you know, a fire, uh, a kinetic uh, event, something where something runs into it, another thing, two cars colliding is energy meeting energy. So you always have the potential for some kind of catastrophic event when you're dealing with energy. So why is hydrogen different than other energy storage mediums like gasoline or oil or propane, things like that? And that's where it's really interesting because I've been working specifically with hydrogen for over 10 years. And I've come to respect hydrogen as an energy storage medium, but I've also come to learn that there's so many myths about hydrogen, it's, it's really hard to kind of dispel them. Because the first thing that I hear when I mention hydrogen to somebody, I tell them I, I do hydrogen vehicles, they go, oh, like the Hindenburg and the H-bomb, and, you know, and right there, it just kind of drags me into a, a dull place where I don't want to be. And, and I go, look, what do you really know about hydrogen as energy storage? Let's talk a couple things about hydrogen energy storage. You know, when you have hydrogen, you have a, a, a source that's 14 times lighter than air. It goes straight up at, six, at 45 miles an hour. So in one second, wow. that energy is six stories above you. And the only way you get hydrogen to burn, like most other flammables, is to mix it with an oxidizer, mix it with air. So when you have a, a, a gas that's moving at 45 miles an hour straight up, it's really hard to get it to mix with an oxidizer, air, oxygen, unless you contain it. If you put air and hydrogen together in a container, it has a pretty broad range of flammability and it will ignite. And if you contain it with a, a, the right mixture, it will actually explode. But so will an empty can of gasoline with a bunch of fumes in it. And so will a propane tank if it's leaking in the house. 
not too many months ago, there was a, a story out of, I think it was Boston, where somebody connected a high pressure propane line to a low pressure distribution system in a neighborhood, and like 20 houses detonated and blew up. Well, that doesn't sound really safe either. Gasoline, same thing. We have tons of fires at gas stations when people are filling their cars and the car's static electricity discharges and the car catches on fire or filling, pro filling tanks in the back of a pickup truck, same thing. So there's, there's always a, an element of danger with hydrogen, but the Hindenburg one is always really gets to me because if you really look at the images and understand what happened there in New Jersey on that, that night in the early 1900s, the Zeppelins that had been flying for decades and moving passengers between Europe and Americas, Europe and South America, had been doing so safely for many, many trips. And that night, this, the, the Hindenburg pulls in during a, a thunderstorm, and it's, it's just getting ready to ground out on the ground, the lines are down, and some kind of spark sets off the surface of the, of the Hindenburg near the top. Maybe there was a slight hydrogen leak there as well. But the skin of the Hindenburg, just like other airplanes and airships at the time, was made of a very flammable substance coating uh, material. And it was a tantamount to thermite, which is an explosive. And it was coating that, that material so it would be able to resist sunlight deterioration and be more, more durable. They called it dope, airplane dope. It was very flammable. So you have a flame that starts on the top of the Hindenburg. And once the flame starts going, and the hydrogen starts leaking out. Now the flame is spreading along with the thermite burning on top of the Hindenburg, and you have a pretty big fire. But remember you said your engineer friends told you hydrogen's explosive? Well, then why didn't the Hindenburg immediately explode into a million pieces and cover half of New Jersey with, with parts? It didn't, it burned. It burned along with the thermite and, and the coating on the, air, on, the, on the blimp. But what else happened? Hydrogen doesn't have any carbon in it. So it doesn't radiate any heat. The heat goes straight up at 45 miles an hour. The people that died in the Hindenburg jumped out of the gondola and, and fell to their death. The people that stayed in the gondola till the Hindenburg got close to the ground basically jumped out and ran away. And most of them survived with just scratches or broken limbs or whatever, but they stayed close to the, the Hindenburg, I mean, close to the, the, the um, stayed in the gondola till they were close to the ground. And so, Wow, how can they do that? Well, the flame and the heat was all going up. It wasn't radiating down and down into the ground and into the cabin where the, the people were. So it's, it's really kind of interesting. I have a really short video. I kind of knew you would lead in with this because people always hit me with the Hindenburg right off the bat. So let's show a short video on what Paul Pontio on the Big on and Blue Planet Research demonstrates when he's talking hydrogen safety. Sounds good dispel some of the myths about hydrogen because most people are afraid of hydrogen. Most people think it's the most explosive thing on the planet and that if you have a small leak in a hydrogen system then it's just destined to explode and burn the building down. Well the reality is is that since it's the lightest element in the universe it's 14 times lighter than air. It goes up at 45 miles an hour when it's let loose that's 66 feet a second. So think about it going 1,001 and it's six stories away of it. It's gone. And because of that, it's very difficult to get a concentration that's flammable at the source of a leak unless you're right at the leak source. And what we do in the classroom is we do it by showing this. So you got a really audible major leak of hydrogen. It's blowing out right now like crazy. And most people would think if there's a spark, it's going to blow up. Well, it'll blow the flame out if I get close enough to it right now. It won't ignite until I get down closer to where it's concentrated enough. But as it's leaking out, it's hitting the ceiling of this building and it's going out that vent. So before I lit it, the hydrogen that had leaked out had already left the building. It's gone. It's moving really, really fast. So the other cool thing about hydrogen is that since there's no carbon in it, it's just purely hydrogen, and it's a little windy in here, but there's no radiant heat. And because of that, you can put your finger about an eighth inch from the flame, and there's no heat, it won't burn. But above right here, it's, it's 500 degrees plus, it's very hot. 
And if you come here, you can actually put your hands over it and you can feel the humidity in the flame because it's making water vapor with the oxygen in the air. I'll turn it down a little bit. The other thing is the other big myth or misunderstanding, it's not a myth, is that hydrogen is invisible when it burns. Well, it is outside. So if we took this in the sunlight, you wouldn't see the flame. But indoors and in sub subdued light, it burns orange. At nighttime, it burns bright orange. Yeah, I mean, I, I can get really, really close. And this tubing will actually, it's actually colder than room temperature right here. It's, it's hot by the jet, but it's pulling the heat out of the air and cooling down. So, so that one, I think that video is really cool. And the other thing Very to point nice. out about the Hindenburg is, you know, like Paul says, most, most people, if you read Wikipedia, say that the hydrogen flame's invisible. Well, if it's invisible and the Hindenburg was on fire, then what was all that fire that we saw? If it wasn't hydrogen, it would be invisible. Technically, if it was hydrogen, most of that flame was actually parts of the Hindenburg that were burning other than the hydrogen. Hydrogen definitely was fueling that fire, though. And it was a hot fire all going straight up. So I hope that kind of gives people a, a feel for the safety. I'll only add that we trained a lot of firefighters here in Hawaii because we did have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles on the military bases. When the federal firefighters finished training, almost to a person, they said, we'd much rather deal with hydrogen than gasoline or propane uh, in, in vehicle fires. So what else you got for me? All right, then. So if it's safe, what exactly is a hydrogen fuel cell and how does it work? Okay, a fuel cell is, is really a cool, it's a cool piece of equipment. And it's a confusing name because when I first started talking to people about fuel cells. They said, oh, is that where you store the hydrogen inside of, fuel, of a fuel cell? And I go, uh, no, I wonder why they gave it such a stupid name. Well, it finally mm -hmm. occurred to me that when you have a battery, like the battery in your car, 12 volt battery, it's actually called a wet cell battery. And when you have a nickel cadmium battery, it's a, it's a, it's a metal, metal battery. Uh, you have dry cell batteries, you have wet cell batteries, you have fuel cell batteries. So a fuel cell is really a self-charging battery. And last week on my show, I showed a video last week that had a really great animation of how a fuel cell works. But basically, a fuel cell is an anode and a cathode, just like a battery has. And on the anode side, you have hydrogen being pushed in. On the cathode side, you have air being pushed in with oxygen. And there's a membrane in between the two, at the anode and the cathode. Now the air, air atom is too big to go through the membrane, and the hydrogen atom is too big to go through the membrane, but they want to get together and make water. So what happens is the hydrogen atom actually sheds its electrons, and the proton on the hydrogen atom goes through the membrane, it goes to the other side, and the electron from the hydrogen atom, the electrons, go around and create a circuit. When you have a circuit, you're making electricity. So what you're doing with a fuel cell is you're running a self-charging battery that takes hydrogen into one side, air into the other side to make water, heat, and electricity. And that's a fuel cell. It's really basic. It's really fundamental. It's really, really cool technology. And there's zero pollution. The water that comes out of a fuel cell, you can just drink it. The vehicles that they make nowadays that use fuel cells either put out evaporated um, evaporation, a little bit of water, in a mist, or they actually collect the water into a little th reservoir that you can drink, or you can just dump it. Water your garden. So, is there anything else about fuel cells that, that you had a question on? No. Um, shall we go on to the next question? What are sure. what are the advantages of hydrogen compared to other fuels? I specifically for energy storage. Okay. I brought a book with me today. So again, this is, this is my, one of my reference books and it's, you can get it in most hardware stores. But what amazed me was one day I was looking through it, looking for something else. And they have a chart in here called battery characteristics. And it has a whole bunch of data on, on batteries. And in the list, I was surprised to see fuel cells. So I went, huh, I wonder how they compare. I wonder how batteries compare side by side to you know, each other and to fuel cells. So I looked in there and I go, okay, ammonia battery. I've never heard of an ammonia battery, but it, it can store 1,400 
amps, amp hours per kilogram. So for every kilogram of, of storage you have, you can get 1400 amp hours of energy out of it. Uh, let me see, they've got um, nickel cadmium batteries. They're 165 amp hours per kilogram. That's pretty good. Lithium batteries, lithium batteries are 865 amp hours per kilogram. That's really good. Uh, I always wondered why we used hydrazine and F-16s for energy storage. And I, under the fuel cells, it has hydrazine is 2100 amp hours per kilogram. That's, that's pretty good compared to the two batteries I just talked about. Lead acid batteries are about 55 amp hours per kilogram. Would you like to hazard a guess what hydrogen is? In a hydrogen uh, fuel cell, in a hydrogen fuel cell system. Oh, did you have a guess? No, no, go ahead. Oh, 20, I was gonna guess like 26,000 amp hours per kilogram. By um, weight, hydrogen is the most energy density storage medium you can get. So when you have a kilogram of hydrogen, you have about two and a half pounds of hydrogen. Think of that. Mm -hmm. Think of that compared to batteries, where for every, in a lead acid battery, every kilogram, is, uh, every kilogram has 55 amp hours of storage, and you want to get to 26,000 amp hours. That's how much, by weight, how much more heavy it is. I try to encourage the Air Force to look at hydrogen, because in aviation, everything's about weight. You know, we're going to take a quick break here for uh, 60 seconds, and we'll be back with Mary, and she can hit me with uh, a couple more questions. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at 1 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about. Human stories about law and life. Aloha. Hello, everybody. My name is Walter Kawai. I, uh, I'm your host for our monthly uh, live streaming video uh, entitled Ukulele Songs of Hawaii, where I bring on guests. We enjoy talking story about the music industry here in Hawaii, uh, sometimes going back uh, 50 decades, if possible and uh, always having some good fun talking with entertainers. We're here located at Think Tech Hawaii, downtown Honolulu at the Pioneer Plaza building and uh, in their studios. And so join me next month for Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man, where I am getting grilled today on my knowledge of hydrogen by Mary Frost from Ohio, someone I met at a Department of Energy conference who was really interested in hydrogen. So, you know, Mary, thanks for, for being with us. And I, I thought of one thing while we're on break. Um, let's throw up that diagram that I have. Here's another really important fact on the hydrogen. You know, I do a lot of hydrogen and transportation, but, you know, we, we are using a lot more renewables on the grid now. And when you really get to large scale storage, this, this graph here is really important. I actually made this graph, but it's, I did it because I've seen graphs from the national labs, from, from reports the national lab has put out, and the commercial sector that have the same kind of information. And I didn't want to do a copyright violation, so I just basically redrew this. But it's really to give you the, the, the idea of where all these energy sources tie in. So across the bottom of the graph is your power from kilowatts to gigawatts. And on the vertical axis are seconds to weeks. So when you're trying to store energy, the two biggest factors of whether it's, it's affordable and vi viable are what, how much energy you're gonna need and for how long you're gonna need to store it. So in the, in the lower left side, you see supercapacitors and things like that, the red oval, that gives you kind of the range where supercapacitors work. They work great for a few seconds and even up into the megawatt range. Above that, you have your, block, your flywheels, which are really an amazing energy storage. It's, it's kinetic energy storage. You just, when you have energy, you spin it up and it can react instantly to fairly high power put outputs. And it doesn't even have any kind of thing except a spinning flywheel made of steel. that's really well balanced on zero friction bearings. 
My engineers go nuts when they see the flywheel piece. Then there's metal batteries, all your lead batteries, your lithium batteries and everything else. They can run really well, react really quickly in the up to a megawatt or so range, maybe even to tens of megawatts for a few minutes to a few hours. Above that are flow batteries. Now, I, I don't, I work with four different flow battery uh, technologies and I'll just be really frank with you, they're not ready for prime time. They have some great uh, capabilities, but they don't work well. We haven't had one that really stayed online for more than a year. So I kind of discount those. Then you kind of see a, a, a green uh, arc in there and it goes long duration and high power. When you get into that regime of this graph where you're storing either high, high megawatts of energy or weeks and weeks of energy or days of energy, you have a couple components there. You can either have compressed air, like if you have a big salt cavern under your city, and you can compress air in there and at night run it back through um, turbines to make electricity. Pumped hydro, where you pump water uphill when you have extra energy, and then you let it flow back through turbines to make a power in the, in the, uh, when you need it. Um, methane and natural gas, if you want to have solid oxide fuel cells, and hydrogen fuel cells. They take that regime, when the, when the grid starts to use energy, talk about energy storage, if they're not talking about hydrogen and methane, they're, they're not looking in the right regime. If they're looking to batteries for the solution, they need to go look at some of the national lab studies to see that they're just not viable. Sounds reasonable. Now, Stan, I, I drive an electric car, so it has lithium ion batteries. So I. I I kind of understand what you're saying about the battery issue. And it has hydrogen been proven in the transportation industry? Actually, hydrogen is actually, this is a surprise to most people on the planet because, you know, unless you live in California um, and visit California a lot, California actually has about 6,000 hydrogen fuel cell commercial production vehicles on the road. And they do because uh -huh. they have the stations to fuel them. The, Almost no other state in the United States has a hydrogen fueling stations for vehicles. We have one in Hawaii put together by the Surfco, the local Toyota dealership. Um, so we do have one commercial hydrogen station that's made just for Toyotas. But the, the, the big vehicle manufacturers are all focused on hydrogen for transportation. And it goes back to that weight to energy thing. If you have batteries in, in vehicles, and you really wanted to go 300 miles like a Tesla, you literally have a ton of batteries in the car. Your Leaf doesn't have a ton of batteries, and it can probably get you 100 miles, 75 miles, and as time goes on, that, those batteries kind of weaken until they can't be used anymore and you have to go buy a new set of batteries. Hydrogen storage tanks are relatively cheap. They're, they're storage tanks. I mean, they're expensive because they're high pressure, but compared to a life cycle cost, they're, they're totally recyclable, they're totally usable. Even if your fuel cell died, your storage is gonna be good for 100 years probably. So in your car, it is proven, and they're in production. In production, they're not prototypes. They're being bought and leased by people in California and driven. I've got a couple slides here of, of vehicles that we've made. Uh, I just brought these as examples. The place that hydrogen really shines the most, and this is really appealing to cities, is in their bus system. These buses are, are hydrogen um, buses that were used in California, and they have several hundred thousand miles on this fleet. And the neat thing they found out about it was, number one, their maintenance time between failure and the bus uh, drivetrain was greatly reduced using electric drivetrains with hydrogen fuel cells. The weight of the bus was light enough that the tires didn't wear out as fast, and they all have regenerative mm -hmm. braking like other electric vehicles like your LEAF, so when you're going downhill and you take your foot off of the accelerator, you're making energy and charging your batteries again. So they're very efficient. The brakes don't wear out very fast. The tires last longer and they're great transportation. The next slide I have Amazing. is, oh, the next slide I have is another real heavy vehicle. This is a super heavyweight vehicle. This vehicle we think is the largest or, or highest capacity vehicle in terms of what it can move for a hydrogen fuel cell. Just last week, we pulled a 200,000 pound military Boeing 707, a KC-135. We pulled it for a ha almost a half a mile using this vehicle. And it runs on a 30 kilowatt fuel cell and has a drivetrain that can move a 10 ton airplane or more. We actually are gonna be testing it up to about 30 tons of pull. 
and that's what this vehicle can do. It's proven. It's proven technology in vehicles. It's proven technology in passenger cars, buses, trucks, the whole spectrum. And it really shines in these heavy Class 8 vehicles and bigger. All right. Stan, we got just a couple of minutes left. So I have a couple more important questions. Can you make hydrogen from solar and wind? That's actually really, really an important question. Right now in Hawaii, we have a, a mandate to be to completely renewable energy by 2045. So we actually have per capita more solar uh, than pretty much any other state in the US. And we have quite a bit of wind as well. The problem is on a utility grid is the grid's responsible to provide stable, reliable power. And when you have solar and wind, they're called intermittent renewables. They, the, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, at night there's no sun. You know, so those things have, sometimes they have a lot of power, sometimes they have nothing. And on the grid, the, the electric companies, when they get to about 25% of intermittent renewable on their grid, they start to come up with problems like stability, where they'll come up with overproduction in solar, and they don't have anything to do with that energy. So they tell you, you got to curtail it, you got to dump it. But what you do is you take all that curtailed power from wind or solar, and whenever it's not needed, you put it into hydrogen and store it. And then you turn around and use it on your grid or you use it for your vehicles. So all that winter energy that's being wasted, and by the way, as we get closer to that 100%, we're gonna be curtailing a lot of energy because we need to store it and use it for nighttime on a much larger scale. And as transportation becomes more electrified, which it will, you're gonna need even more energy storage. And again, that's where hydrogen shines. Very impressive. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, how would hydrogen energy storage be? Well, you already spoke about the grid and that it would be advantageous. So that was my that was my last question. I think well, there's, another, there, a, there's another great part about the grid that I forgot to mention. So thanks for reminding me. But, you know, when when you have that stability issue on the grid, you, yes. When you make the hydrogen, it can actually be a load. So right now, when a utility company is operating, they have what's called a spinning reserve. They'll actually run mm -hmm. a generator all the time just in case they need the energy. And what I'm trying to do on our microgrid project is take, get our engineers to agree that a flywheel can do that more efficiently than a, than a, a, a generator. And hydrogen can do it as well by becoming a load where instead of instead of trying to ramp up generation, you can take that solar and you can turn it into a, into a, a production of hydrogen and basically level your, your um, distribution of energy using the, the electrolyzer as a load instead of using it just to generate hydrogen. It can actually be something to help the grid stabilize itself. So there you go. And, and uh, you know what? I know that you probably have some more questions somewhere and. I'm going to give you some more time, and we're going to have you back on another show sometime, and we're going to keep doing this because I really, I really had a good time, and I appreciate your, your passion, and I appreciate you taking the time to spend some time with me today, and I'm going to leave you the last minute or so to say whatever you'd like, and, and uh, we'll call it a wrap for today. So thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you very much for letting me ask you my questions. As a, as a financial accountant, so I think if I come back on again, I may have to actually grill you next time. <laughs> okay. I better bring it's my economic nine. advisor. I'll bring my economic advisor with me so I can do that. Because, um, yeah, we, we, that's also another question I get asked a lot. How much does a hydrogen station cost to build? How much is the infrastructure? When's the, what's the return on investment? Those kind of things. And right. that's a, actually a fairly complex field. And a lot of it has to do with economy of scale and things. But those are some great questions we'll hit next time. So. So promise me you'll come on and grill me again. Oh, I would enjoy that. Thank you very much for having okay. me. Well, Mary, Mary Frost, thanks for being on the show today. And uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, for my last show as a state employee where I won't have to do this on my lunch hour anymore, aloha from Stan oh. Energy Man. And we'll, we'll, we'll see you uh, when I'm a civilian next uh, Friday. Aloha. Okay. Oh, mahalo. Thank you, Stan. <laughs>